All right. We made it. Finally made it. So, since we are 20 some minutes late, let's dive into it. Gracious Father, we come before you humble, sincere, trying to be obedient. We come before you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. For your word said, where two or three are gathered in your name, we come in that mighty name, that you will be in the midst. God, we thank you for, even if it's just one more person coming with the right mindset, we know you're in the midst. And even if we'll bow ourselves, we know that we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with us. And we bless you, God, for opportunities to worship, to praise, to magnify, to glorify your holy name. We give honor to you this day because we're just grateful to be here. We're grateful to be alive. And we ask you in the name of Jesus Christ to forgive us of all our sins, slothfulness, laziness, disobedience, whatever things that we walked in today that became little foxes that tried to destroy the vine but turned into sin in our lives. We humbly ask you to forgive us, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And as we prepare to do the roundtable discussion in reference to the assignment, the two movies, the Sunday morning rapture and the passion of Christ, we pray, O oh, Heavenly Father, that something will be said, spoke on, that will open up our understanding and enlighten our mindset, that we will see things a little bit different, and that we will get in a hurry, realizing that as the Sunday morning rapture showed us, just that quick, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, even this moment as we're talking now, you can come back to get us. And we want to be a prepared people for a prepared place. And we pray, God, that we will continue to hunger and thirst after you, continue to walk in obedience, that we will hear the trumpet sound, whether we're dead already in Christ or whether we're still here on this earth, that we will hear the trumpet sound and that we will be glorified because we receive glorified bodies and that we will honor you in this life that we live today. We love you and we appreciate you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, God bless you. Amy Jones, beautiful story. Brenda Benjamin, Keona Morgan, God bless you all. Amen. Um, we give people a few minutes to come in. Amen. So we can start our little roundtable discussion. Amen. I do apologize for being late. Um, it got hectic. Um, I had to had some problem with my lawnmower had to go come get mother truck go drop that off go it was just a lot hey man we got it done hey man and uh he's gonna be doing some work on it for me tomorrow while i'm going to the funeral if the lord say the same because i come monday i need to be wide open i need to be wide open so i hope you are so ready courtney my daughter god bless you Kaylin T, God bless you. Amen. And many others that are watching. Amen. This is the, instead of today having our guest, normally we would try to have a guest on Fridays. But instead, we had an assignment to watch uh, Sunday morning rapture and to watch the passion of Christ and to come on tonight to have a discussion about those two movies. Amen. And see what we got from God through those movies. Um, it's going to be interesting. I believe that. And I believe, I believe it's going to be educational, knowledgeable, and a blessing at the same time, because you have so many people have different perspective of what they see. And that's what we're trying to do tonight to bring out the different perspectives of what they saw or what they got out of the movie. There's no wrong questions. There's no wrong answers unless it contradicts the word of God. Every question to answer is something somebody else may want to ask, but too ashamed to ask. 
And so if you leave, feel something laid on your heart, amen, just ask it. And we may not have all the answers, but to the best of our abilities, we would try to answer the question. Katrina Johnson Henderson, God bless you. So tonight is the questionnaire, if you want to call it, on the two movies that we was assigned to watch. Again, the Sunday morning rapture and the passion of Christ. And, and we will have a discussion about it. We already did our prayer, amen. And, and uh, we will start with the passion of Christ first. Let's start with that one first. And we'll try to do 30 minutes on each, but we'll see how the Holy Spirit moves. Amen. Again, we're trying to uplift each other. It's not that one person know more than the other. But your perspective of what you got out of the movie, amen, like I said, it could be a blessing to somebody. And again, for all of you just came on, I do apologize for my late lateness because I was cutting grass and had a problem with my lawnmower and had to take it to the shop. So I thank God either way that I'm still here, amen. Uh, even the day cutting grass, some car that was shooting by where I was parked at and if I was stepped out at the wrong time. Amen. Praise God. We wouldn't have had no meetings tonight. So I thank God for so many things, the seen and the unseen dangers of life. Uh, so we would, uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. So let's get into this. Let's get into the conversation. To open it up without me calling the names yet. Someone tell me a summary of what you got out of the movie. Just a just a short summary. What did you feel the Lord was showing you from the movie? We, we just on the Passion of Christ right now. So if you come in and start asking questions about Sunday morning rapture, I'm just gonna ignore you. But at this moment, what was a summary you feel the Lord was showing you individually in the wholeness of the movie? Somebody come with it. True Annie or 100. That's true. Anybody? This thing, the movie started out while waiting on somebody to respond. The movie started out with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And of course, you know, the movie, it had flashbacks. Amen, because everything was dealing with those moments. Amen, Sister Morgan, that, that one is so true. The price he paid for our debt. Amen, a debt we couldn't pay because this sin nature was too much. Amen, he came on the scene that we would have grace because up to the time he came on the scene, we were still, or they were still under the dispensation of the law. And man could not obey all 300 some laws. He came to not destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And when he came on the scene, grace came with him. And we are living in the dispensation of grace, even now in the church age, because of what he did um, during that time. And the movie itself is a, is a dramatical event we don't know if those exact things took place but it lines up so much closer to scripture than any movie i ever watched and uh i like when she said the price he paid is love 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 because mm, i felt the anointing even when the movie started jesus was agonizing in the movie and the scripture says the same thing he was they don't say he was agonizing but he was agonizing and the bible says that he prayed so hard that sweat fell from his bra brow like drops of blood his sweat became so thick he was so agonizing and in the day's time we would say he was stressful stressing out he would have an anxiety attacks he was suffering every emotion that we go through why the Bible says he was tempted above measure, above measure as we were or are, but yet without sin. 
He felt every emotion we feel. He felt fear. Fear didn't dominate him. No, nah, don't, don't, don't twist it now. Because I said Jesus felt fear. Because if he had not felt fear, but fear didn't dominate him, he never sinned. He wouldn't have said, Father, let this cup pass if possible. Let this cup pass. In other words, this I got to go through is too much for this flesh. But the Bible said that the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. He was willing to do his father's will. He had to experience everything that the flesh goes through so we can relate to him and he understands us because now he walked in that fleshly image and had every emotion, every feeling that we have, but yet without sin. That's right. There was no hope until Jesus volunteered to save us. And so when you look at how the movie started, yeah, good point, Kaylin T. So in the garden, that was an image of a man, right? And we know that represented Satan. And it, it cast the image of what we go through now. We don't physically see Satan. Some people do see in the supernatural. We don't physically see Satan, but what the movie represented is Satan or demonic, demon, demonic entities talking to us like Satan was talking to him. You notice he ignored him, right, in the movie. And the same thing he told us to do in scripture, cast down every imagination, every thought that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, right? So the movie represented the same things we go through when we're struggling with worried about losing our homes or jobs or issues in our family with our children, our spouses, whatever it may be. Those same agonies we feel as he was praying, we pray. And while we pray, we hear the enemy speaks to us. So the movie represented Satan trying to figure out who he was, but trying to mess with him at the same time. Who is your father? You know, things like that. Have not you been praying and you heard the enemy say, where is your God? When it don't seem like God is moving when you thought he should be moving. So the movie starts out with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying in agony, goes to the disciples and they, can ye not watch with me for one hour? Amen. And uh, Okay. So goes on the movie. It, it goes back and forth how Judas went to betray him. And Judas caught up in money. And a lot of us get caught up in things and we turn on each other. We're not even trying. And sometimes, how, oh, well, how do you say we turn on each other? Sometimes when you talk about them and dog them behind their back, you turn on them. You know, sometimes we do things, but we want to look at other people and say, oh, they committed this sin. They did this. They did that. But if you stay sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit, one thing I learned about God, every time you find yourself comparing with somebody else did, God always have a way to showing you what you did. Every time, man, I'm telling you, every time I think about what somebody said or done, they shouldn't have done this, they shouldn't have said that. He always showed me something that I had done or said I shouldn't have done or said. Why is that important? God is always teaching us that none of us are perfect and we ought to be so humble to the point that instead of talking about what they should have, would have, could have did, we should be interceding for them just as somebody was interceding for us. So, goes on in the movie. Any, anybody got any questions so far? I mean, I see people making statements, but anybody have questions of what they saw to a point, right? And so, only reason I don't have my notes because I swapped trucks and I realized I left my notes in the other truck. The truck I left to get my lawnmower fixed with. I love everything. And I realized all my notes for that movie, I had like 10 questions, 10 questions. And all them notes are there in my truck. 
Uh, so let's get into the movie. The points of the movie to see that you all watch and study. Peter was bold, right? Peter was bold. Drew the sword, cut the servant's ear off. In the midst of all that, Peter was bold all through the Bible until what Jesus said about him came true. He said, before the cock crowed three times, thou shalt deny me three times. Before it crowed, thou shalt deny me three times. Uh, so, I'm going to get to that, Kayla T. I see that. Thank you. And fear comes upon all of us. The key is why that we allow fear to control us. We identified fear came on Jesus. That's why he asked, let this cup pass. But immediately the Holy Spirit strengthened him. And he said, nevertheless, not my will, but God's will be done. All right. Many times we have been asked to do things in church or anywhere. And immediately fear takes over. Oh, no, can you get somebody else? Let me tell you something. It's an honor. It's a privilege to do anything for the kingdom of God. It's an honor and a privilege to do anything that will uplift the body of Christ as a whole. It's an honor and a privilege to do anything that in a spiritual sense builds your resume. Amen. Because we shall be judged according to our works our work shall be established the old saying is only what you do for god shall last so fear grabbed peter and the bible says that when they cornered him he cursed them yeah peter lost who he was he cursed them and denied christ the part that stood out to me is the the actor portraying christ so to the point to me if you look at the characteristics of jesus christ this actor played these characteristics to the t to me even in the midst of all that was going on in the movie the actor showed such compassion such mercy the look on the face of pity and mercy even when the people was beating him stoning him not stoning him spitting on him mocking him kicking him all these things they was doing you look how not one time in the movie did it depict him with anger. Not one time. And that's the same way Jesus was. That's why I say that it's so awesome how Mel Gibson put this movie together. And God, I believe God moved on him to guide this movie the way it went. Because when you're connected to the Holy Spirit, that is one of the few movies I can say I can feel the anointing. While I'm watching the movie to the point that the spirit bear witness. And when it bear witness, the rivers of living water begin to just come up out of me. And it began to move in me and the anointing begin to stir me up. And so when you look at every scene when they were beating him, he didn't show none but, of course, pain, agony. But he showed so much love, even as an actor, he showed so much love towards the people that were doing them wrong. So I'm watching the movie, yeah, I'm getting mad just watching it. Yeah, because it hurts me to see it. And even when they were beating him, I found myself jumping and speaking in tongues because of the anointing was shifting in me. And the power of God was shifting me as I was watching. I had to turn away from it. Not that I didn't want to see it, but to understand in my spirit all Jesus really went through just for me. Why did I say it like that? Because you need to make it personal. Just for me. You cannot fully understand the greatness of God until you make it personal. You can't always look at it as overall. Yeah, it is overall. It's for the body as a whole. But it becomes personal. When the Bible talks talking about an intimacy, a relationship with God, it has to be personal. It has to mean something to you, not just a conversation piece that you hear about. It has to be real. And so when they when they was uh when Pilate told him, basically talk to me, I got the power to 
save your life, take your life, blah, blah, blah. And I love what Jesus said. He's basically, he said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. And I think Caitlin Teal, someone said that earlier, um, how he was so gently gave his life. He showed so much compassion in the movie. And I'm telling you, I can almost imagine Christ doing this for us because he couldn't be God that is so merciful and so truthful and so holy and righteous. He couldn't be God displaying what we as humans would display, anger and bitterness, rage and all that. That wouldn't be God. See, he is trying to teach us to go beyond the fleshly things and walk in the spiritual things. See, the flesh wants to retaliate. When somebody does something to you in the flesh, it wants to retaliate. It wants to get even. It wants to get back. It wants to do a lot of things that are not godly because the flesh in itself, with the enemy speaking to the flesh, teams up, tries to teams up against the spirit. But when you're walking in the spirit, ah, when you're flowing in the spirit, you obey the spirit. You don't react in the flesh. A lot of us still to this day react in the flesh because the spirit is not controlling you because you allow the flesh to dominate you. So it ain't my saying, it's the Bible saying, it's God saying, walk in the spirit that you would not give in to the desires of the flesh. And so when Jesus being who he was, in the midst of all that he went through, we saw the movie, if it wasn't for his love and wasn't for the compassion and mercy that he's shown, he could have never said it and meant it when he said, Father, forgive them. Even the soldiers began to take notice. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And one of the soldiers said, he's praying for us. I think it was a soldier or one of the thieves. So since y'all ain't asking no question, I ain't got my notes with me. We, we, we got the flow with it, right? And Sister Kate, I ain't going to forget about your question. And so the scene that when Peter, amen, the third time he denied him, he fell down. And by that time, they had threw Jesus down near Peter. Can you imagine how much hurt? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How much hurt and agony Peter must have felt to know that what was said just came true and that he denied Jesus. Oh, my God. And Jesus, in the actress, actor form, looked at him with such compassion. That actor played that part. Such compassion, even after Peter did it, that's how he is with us. He know we're going to do these things, we do. And yet he still looks upon us with so much compassion and love. Willing that none should perish, but all come to repentance. Man, we serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. And so... Peter left away hurt. That's how I felt when I was in my darkest moments a year and a half ago. When I did disobeyed Christ and was doing what I wanted to do, but mostly wouldn't do what he wanted me to do. When he brought me back into his presence, I felt so guilty and so shame. I felt so hurt and so lonely. I do not understand, after experiencing it myself, how can we get a taste of Jesus and want to go back and taste the bitterness of the world? I just don't understand it because I couldn't even understand it when I did it. Why would I risk my soul for moments of life or whatever it may be, right? So when they took Jesus to beat him, the Bible says, 40 times minus one, 39 stripes, 39 stripes. And when you look at the scriptures, I don't remember reading the scripture about metal, even though in the movie they had metal. 
in the scriptures, I think it said sharp rocks and something else. But either way, it drew flesh from his bones. Even yet in that movie, we were still able to identify his face. Even though they hit him in the eye, swollen his eye, man, I'm telling you, I don't know how you feel. But just watching those scenes, if I would have been there, either fear would have took over me and I'd have been scared to react, or I'd have hit one of them soldiers because of what they were doing to me. Because that's how much, even watching the movie, rage wanted to come up in me. Why would they do my savior like that? I know why, but that's, you know, what I was asking myself. I was angry. And it was a movie, and I was angry because he loved me so much that he took that just for me. And so when they beat him, harsh, I caught all the whole shot. There was a scene in the movie. It don't say in the Bible whether it happened or not. But there was a scene in the movie that they stopped hitting him because they was finna stop. And it's almost like because scripture, all I could think about was scripture had to be fulfilled. That he pulled himself up with all his strength and might. And they looked at him. And when he pulled himself up, he put himself back in position. It's almost like he was saying, finish so scripture can be fulfilled. And... Uh, even to the point where he was in so much pain, his hand was sh man it was so realistic. It was it was so much pain. My spirit was agonizing, watching it. But at the same time, the perspective to understand what Christ did for me, make it personal. It made me look at my life. And say, there's no excuse to sin. There's no excuse not to serve him. There's no excuse not to worship him. There's no excuse to be religious when he gave us instruction through the word. There are no excuse to be caught up in tradition of man when the word gives us instruction how to present our bodies, how to live, how to be not conformed, how to come out from among them. There's no excuse to go through the emotion of life when he has given us the guidance of holiness. And watching what he went through, even though it was a dramatic movie, but it was so lined up with scripture. So you have to imagine a little bit that a lot of that actually took place. Maybe not identical, but the suffering and the beating. He was beaten, the scripture says, beyond recognition. No identifying him. But yet, just like in the movie, he never said a moment in word. Why? Why, Sister Kaylee? Why beautiful story? Because he had us on his mind. Hallelujah. God, I thank you. And it was almost like he was saying, if I don't do this, in 2024, when they need me the most, I won't be there if I don't go through this or they won't be there. And the scripture says he never said a moment in word. When they questioned him before the beatings, he was short statements. Are you the king of the Jews? Thou sayest. When Pilate said, I have authority to take your life, he said, I lay down my life. No man can take it, but I lay it down. All of those things, right? They rather release, but scripture had to be fulfilled. Yes, beautiful story. That is probably, I was going to get that. We'll get to that in a minute, that statement you made. So he never said a mumbling word. He took it. 
Scripture had to be fulfilled. 40 minus 1, 39 slashes. Flesh ripped from his bones, swole, mocked, spit on, uh, cru 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 uh, criticized, everything that he didn't have to do. But he chose to do it so we would have life. And this is the sad part about it. The Bible says, call no man a fool. But yet in scripture, it says, thou fool. What did it mean? Why did he say thou fool in scripture when it say call no man a fool? Because it say thou fool, thou soul is required at this hour. You got to be a fool according to the scripture to not receive what Jesus did for us to receive eternal life. There's no other way to God except through his son, even though people are trying to find all other ways. He said, I am. Oh, bag it up. What did God say to Moses when Moses said, who am I to tell them who sent me? He said, I am that I am. And Jesus came back because he is God and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can go into the Father except by or through me. The great I am in the form of his son established the foundation of the world. John says, John chapter 1 says, all things were made by him and for him. Was nothing made that was not made by him. So, he took that beating. I thought about this. When all of those soldiers and all of those Pharisees and Sadducees, the high priests and all of them, when they finally died and went into hell, the truth was revealed. They knew without a doubt they crucified the Son of God. Unless they converted, and the Bible don't say, but down the line somewhere when the apostle was preaching the gospel, probably not because they were stuck in the tradition of the law, but Paul, Saul did, became Paul. He was a Pharisee of his Pharisees, I think, yeah. But every one of them eventually died. And if they didn't accept Christ for what he did, what they saw him do, when they lifted their eyes in hell, they knew without a doubt they crucified the Son of God. Can you imagine you were the one who hit Christ? Can you imagine you the one put them thorns on his head? Can you imagine you the one spit on and slap him to my prophesy? Can you imagine the mockery and to die and realize you messed up? That's no different now. Can you imagine you sitting in church all your life and have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Have not walked in righteousness but just in religion? Have not obeyed the Spirit but walked in your flesh? Have not walked in the fruits of the Spirit but walked in the works of the flesh that said they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God? No different than them. If you don't repent, we shall all likewise perish except we repent and then strive to walk in obedience to his word. Can you imagine? Never getting it right and die. They die. All of them dead. And a lot of them, probably most of them, Lifted their eyes in hell and realized I messed up and I can't get it right now. There are some people that's alive today going to lift their eyes in hell and realize I had so many chances and I didn't take it. And people laugh at these kind of movies and God is allowing the word to be spread in all the world. That's part of the word. Anything that glorifies God is part of the word. Amen. So he's taking a movie form, touch the heart of a man to direct the movie, to be the closest thing to scripture I ever seen to people can see it, feel it and understand it. And yet still so many will reject it. Let's move on. We want to get into another movie. So he took that for us. After being beaten and it don't say they fed him that night. They don't say they fed him and they probably didn't but yet 
he had to carry that cross up that rocky hill. And the Bible is true when they got the uh, Simon, Simon, the, the African guy, it was in the Bible, it's in the scripture. They got him to help Jesus carry the cross. Can you imagine weak and feeble, bruised and battered, flesh still hanging from your bone, blood dripping out you, pain, swole. You know how we stomp our toe now. We hurt and we swole from being beaten. And yet, in my mind, he carrying his cross. He's struggling, but he's carrying his cross. He's weak, but he's carrying his cross. And I got to make it personal. I got to do this for Floyd. I got to do this for Floyd. I got to do it for Floyd. Because you got to make it personal. We know he did it for everybody, but everybody ain't going to receive it. So you got to make it personal. If everybody that know he did it for everybody will accept what he's done, then hell wouldn't keep enlarging itself. The Bible says that hell was created for the devil and his angels, but because man won't obey, man won't stop sinning, man won't follow the instructions of the word, hell enlarges itself daily. There's a lot of Christians in hell. Oh, yes, it is. Because you don't make it into heaven just because you became a Christian, which is Christ's light. You have to duplicate live that statement of Christ's life. You have to present your body a certain way. You have to be not conformed. You have to separate yourself. You have to be obedient because obedience is better than sacrifice. You have to love him by obeying the scripture because he asked the question. Amen. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Being a Christian ain't going to get you in. You got to be holy. He said, holiness without no man shall see the Lord. He didn't say Christian without. He didn't say Baptist without, Pentecostal without, Catholic without, Mormon without, Geo Witness without. He said holiness without. Holiness without. No man shall, shall as a promise, see the Lord. Being a member of your church for 50 years ain't going to get you in. The only church you need, I ain't got it with me, is the Bible. That's the only church you need. You need a church to grow. You need a physical church to go to because he said for Satan not the assembly of the brethren. He wants you to have a physical church, but your hope shouldn't be in the church. Your hope should be in the word of God. Too many people hope is in the pastors. Too many people hope is in the physical church and do everything for the church, but won't live saved outside the church. Do everything for the church and won't love your neighbors outside the church. The church ain't going to get you in. You got to live holy and you got to be obedient to the spirit of Christ. You got to be obedient. So he, he went to the cross. And it goes back to the statement, beautiful story made. I don't know if that's scripture. I don't remember it being scripture, but I love it. I love it. When he failed and his mother in the movie pressed to get to him. And when he realized she got up to him. And uh, that, oh my God, that part by itself almost brought me to tears. It allowed that spirit of the living God to come forth out of me. Amen. It allowed the Holy Ghost to quicken me. And it said when he fell down and she ran to him and he said, other words, mother, I make things, all things new. That did something to me. That did something to me. And yet, God has given us newness of life. And we won't even take it. I ain't talking about the salvation because there's nothing you have to do to get salvation. Grace does that for you. All you got to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. But you got to live beyond that. Amen. You got to live beyond that. Amen. You may get promoted on a job as a supervisor. But the promotion ain't going to stay there if you don't do nothing as a supervisor. If you don't demonstrate that you can be a supervisor. So salvation by itself is like a promotion, spiritual promotion. But you got to put some works in it to understand who you are and what you are. So, y'all ain't got no questions. Let's go. He make all things new. All right. We got that. So he goes to the cross. He's weak. 
he's battered, he's bruised. And let's bag up a chapter or two. Judas, after he realized what he did, he tried to get the silver back. It don't say in the Bible, it's showing, I mean, it don't say in the movie, but it showed him throw the money down back at the high priest. But the Bible said the high priest took that money and purchased a field with Judas was the area that Judas uh, died in. I think they purchased it and it became like a, I don't know, like a cemetery or something like that with that 30 pieces of silver. Well, Judas is the son of prediction. Scripture says that. Jesus said to the father, all they have given to me, I have lost none except the son of prediction. Judas was the son of prediction. But God wouldn't be God and he wouldn't be gracious if Judas didn't have a chance to repent. I know some of y'all said, no, nah, Judas died in the sin. He did. He committed suicide, hung himself. The movie showed him being tormented. That is true. It used children in the movie, whatever the case may be, but in the spiritual realm, when you walk out the will of God, you are being tormented. They come at you. Why? Because the Bible says if you break the head, surely the serpent will bite. The serpent represents the devil. It's demonic whores. So when we willfully sin, we open ourselves up to torment. Most people in the sight you and I deal with quote scriptures all day long. Yeah, most of them grew up in the church, know the word of God. And they are tormented. They sit there and they quote scriptures and they cuss you out at the same time. That's a good, that's a good question, beautiful story. It could have been. It could have been, you know, in that. What you're saying could be true. That's a good way to look at it. In that period of time, everything that was considered wrong, it was always some form of fasting and ripping of the garments, sackcloth, ripping of the garments, in in uh in show of disbelief of what you did, in show of uh telling God you're not you don't have nothing to do with that, in a sense. Uh, but that's a good way to look at it. Because the kingdom was taken from them. I mean, high priesthood was taken from them and given to the high priest, Jesus himself. That's a good point. I don't know if it's scripture or not in reference to what you're saying. Could be. I just don't know. Uh, but that's a good point to look at it when he did that. And it was, it was a show of religion because that's what they did. They did the sackcloth. And the, remember we did Isaiah 58 about the fasting? And they said that we did this and this, the sackcloth, the ripping of the clothes, the, the ashes. Those all was form of religion because that's what they did. But when Jesus came on the scene, you had to serve God with a pure heart. You didn't have to serve God no more in re religious rituals. Now you had to serve God with a pure heart. So the priest did what they normally do in disbelief of something or disagreement with something. But I like how you put it because that could have been the case too. That could have been case too. Good point. I like that. So... We go and, and Jesus, Judas did what he did. He had a chance to repent. He could have, but he was in pain, agony, and he just, he couldn't bear. I can imagine them demons tormenting him like the movie depicted. I mean, you got to have an imagination sometimes. And so now we go back to the cross. Jesus got to the top of the hill. That had been a long, painful walk, carrying a heavy cross. After being beaten, probably not fed, probably not given water, swollen and bruised. I couldn't have done it. I ain't gonna even sit here and act like some people want to act like they saw a hold it. Oh, I, I God gave me strength. No. The world wouldn't be here today if my, my sacrifice depicted all of us getting salvation. It took God Himself. Nobody else can do it. That's why he say, give me a body, I'll go. He came himself because man couldn't do that. Man couldn't do that. Man couldn't uphold that. No, we couldn't have done that. Only one person can do that, and he did it, Jesus Christ himself. So, and in the movie, they show him putting the nails in his hand. God, that's so realistic. It was so realistic. 
the agony and the pain he was in, it was so realistic. And the one time they show him just his eye looking up in heaven. Can you imagine what the Bible said from the sixth to the ninth hour he hung there? If I'm not mistaken, that's three hours. And he was in so much pain. He was so uncomfortable that either way he turned, it was pain. It was agonizing. It was tor torment. And he, I can imagine he's standing there saying, I have to do so scriptures can be fulfilled because my God is not a liar. Because remember, when he got to a certain point of time, he said, it is finished. And then he said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. Because he had scripture had to be fulfilled. And the agony and pain he had to be in to lay there. But yet, when they went to break his legs because they were rushing, I'm going to tell you what blow my mind. And it's dramatic. It's part of the movie, dramatic. When that one teardrop fell from heaven. Oh, my God. I, I was picturing my mind. I had to stop thinking like that because the Bible said in heaven there'd be no more no tears. So I can't picture God shedding tears. But for that moment, I was saying to myself, can you imagine that the heavens were crying, that the clouds had to shed tears, and the thunderstorm had to come because it shed tears. The creation moaned and travailed because of what would happen to the Savior. And when that tear, dramatic as it is, if I like it, hit the ground. Boom. My pastor used to preach a sermon. Everything that could be shaken will be shaken. There was a lot of shaking going on. That was a lot of shaking going on. The temple. Can you imagine the priest and all these people at that time saying, uh oh, what did we do? Now, there was one point the priest said, if thou be the Christ, come off the cross. I think that was Satan using them to say, uh-oh, we don't messed up. We need to get him off that cross. We need to get him off that cross. We need to get him off that cross. But when the temple split in half, the key to that whole scripture is the veil. The veil represented the law. When the veil was split, Jesus came then to fulfill the law, not to destroy the law. The law, the dispensation of the law ended right then. And grace took over. He, when he gave up the ghost, grace showed up on the scene. Grace showed up on, he was grace already. But when he gave up the ghost, grace showed up on the scene. Hallelujah. Because at that moment he died. I want you to get this now. At the very moment he died. At that moment, I believe everybody in the world was forgiven of their sins. Oh, watch it now. He said, look at the authority of who said it. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If he said it, they was forgiven. Then this was also what happened. The Bible said he bared every sin. Every infirmity, only he took every sin to the cross that by grace we can go boldly in humility to the throne of grace saying, Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me of my sin. But I believe at that very moment because of the power of the word that he said, everybody out there, everybody a lot of doubt, the one that beat him, the one that mocked him, the one that spit on him, the one that threw dice for his clothes. Every one of them was forgiven. It was what they did after that. It was what they did after forgiveness. So, what they did after that, right? And it's scripture, though. It said they saw the dead rising up. That's the only time in the Bible 
other than when that familiar spirit came impersonating Saul. That's the only time in the Bible it talked about how the dead walked the street. In there's in the Bible, when Jesus set the captives free, the dead walked the street and transitioned up to heaven. In transition. They don't walk no street. The devil is a lie. They were transitioning. They were going up a little young, a little higher. So <laughs> he said, after he said the seven last sayings of Christ, Father, forgive them, don't know what they do. And he said, It is finished. Devil, you don't messed up. He said, Into my hand, I commend thy spirit. And he was gone. Went into hell, according to scripture. Took the steam from death, the keys from hell. Set the captives free. Instantaneously, he set the captives free. When the temple is rent, we do not have to go to a priest to ask for forgiveness no more. We can go to the high priest, which is Jesus Christ. And the Bible says we pray to the Father in the name of the Son. He shall hear us and answer us. Amen. He said, if you call, I am. You knock, the door shall be open. All we got to do is believe the word of God because he died for us. And um, the passion of Christ is probably one of the most dramatic, closest to scripture movies I ever seen about Jesus Christ. And we're going to stop there on that movie unless y'all got some more questions. Bring something to my mind that I might have overlooked. Oh, Sister Kaylin. When Jesus said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Scripture said that God would never leave us nor forsake us. So he knew that God has never forsaked us. But I'm going to show you how much God hates sin. The Bible said that sin cannot dwell in the presence of God. Just like the flesh can't dwell in the presence of God, right? When Jesus bared the on the cross, the sins of the world, I believe that God couldn't even stand to look at the sins. And that got to have a little imagination because it ain't scripture. Uh, I believe that God turned his back spiritually and Jesus felt the presence of God's shield because in his human flesh, in the agony and pain, he was still in his flesh, but yet not sinning. He says, why hast thou forsaken? He knew God hadn't forsaken him. Because if God had forsaken him, then he would have knew that uh, he wouldn't have been able to say, Father, forgive them. He wouldn't have been able to say, in thy, in thy hand I commend my spirit. But that's how much God hates sin. So yet now, because Jesus died for all our sins and took them all to the cross. Do we not understand that when we willfully sin, we all walk in sin. This flesh is a mess. But when we willfully sin, knowing, knowing right from wrong, the scriptures say to know to do right and not do it is sin. When we do that, do we not know how much it displeases God to the point that he can stand to watch us because of our sins? Yeah, good point, beautiful story. Jesus is the mediator because God would not look upon us with our sins. Sin, the Bible said, is like a dirty rag in the nostril of the Lord. A dirty rag at that time was what women used for their cycle. And it's like it's thanks to that degree to God because he can't stand sin. Amen. Shall we continue in sin that grace meant, that grace what Jesus did didn't mean nothing? Shall we willfully keep sinning? Shall we willfully be going to church and still sinning? That Grace may abound that it don't mean nothing that Jesus did all that for nothing. No, God forbid, Paul said. Don't even consider it. Well, that was a good point, what you said, Kaylin T. But let me tell you what the scripture says about that. It says, I believe in the book of Isaiah, it pleased God to bruise him because it was for the benefit of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the scripture said it pleased God to bruise him. Now give me a second. Let me open this door so I can watch the adventure. All right. It pleased God to bruise him. Okay. 
because when God said, I need somebody, who can I send? Who will go? Who can I send? Who will go? I think that in the book of Isaiah as well. And he said, send me, prepare me a body. I'll go. He was so proud of his son that he said, Father, I'll go. I'll go. Because remember, Jesus was with him in Genesis. He said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. So that good observation, good observation. So um, any other questions on the passion of Christ before we move on to the next movie? We already been almost an hour on that movie. I didn't mean to be that long. I mean to be 30 minutes, but any more questions on that on that movie in particular? But yeah, uh, the movie is so emotional. I, I had to fight back tears. But you know why I keep watching it? I ain't gonna never stop watching it. You know why? Because sometimes we need to be reminded of what he did for us. It's one thing to think what he did, but to see something that's close to reality, it shifts you a different way. And sometimes when we're thinking about lusting, we're thinking about pornography, we're thinking about masturbating, we think about lying, we think about gossip, we think about being negative, we think about doing all these sinful things that the works of the flesh in Galatians 5 and 19 tell us in verse 21 that they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. When we think about doing those things, sometimes we need to be reminded are really what he did the bible said when we get this kind of information right we get this kind of word immediately the enemy comes and try to choke out what you got amen so sometimes stuff like that movies like that scriptures preacher preaching certain sermon listen to the same sermons over and over again sometimes it's right when you need to hear it watch it or see it that it will strengthen you when you're thinking about doing wrong because we always need to be rem reminded or really what Jesus did. I love the de de the depiction, de depictable issues of the reality of the beatings, the mockery, the suffering, the pain, because he made the movie realistic. And we, we still can't even fathom what our Savior went through for us. We really can't even fathom that. So y'all can still ask questions about that movie, but we're going to shift. And knowing that he did all that, now we shift to Sunday morning rapture. And just like in the movie Sunday morning rapture, there were so many people left because of what we've been talking about. They was at the church when they got left. The preacher started to move off. What if God came on a Sunday? Ah, so we talked about the other day. What do grace ends? Where is your time? What sin will finally keep you out? What what we we don't know. So when we don't know, why take a chance on being left behind because you know to do right and not do it is sin, right? So I thought about that. What if he did come on a Sunday and a lot of y'all ain't at church that Sunday? Now I'm not saying that will keep you out, but what if? Some of you all that still saying you're waiting on God to give you a home church. It take God two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months, ten months, one year, two years. Come on now. You just don't want to go. Be real with it. So it's between you and God. But what if? What if that one rebellious decision is what keep you out the kingdom? What if? Just, just a thought, right? What if? Now, me personally, I shouldn't be trying to talk nobody and going to church if it was about money, because I want you to come to this church, pay tithes on him to me, so I can take some of your money. No, man, I ain't studying that. I care about your souls. So at the end of the day, we have to know what God is saying for us to do, right? What if it happened on a Sunday? Uh, what if? Look how many people watching their cars, kind of like the brother in the movie, watching their cars on Sunday, watching the games. Uh, women's shoes had all week long to clean your house. But you choose Sunday to clean your house instead of go to church. Uh, you choose Sunday to have a family gathering, but you got to stay home and cook. Why is it that people don't recognize the trick of the enemy where you can have everything to do all week long, but you let the devil miss with you on a Wednesday night Bible study or Sunday? And that seemed like well, you got to get something done. Come on, for real. Do you not see how subtle and how easily the enemy can trick us? Five days we work. 
God asks for two. Really, he asks for every day. God wants you to spend time with him every day. But in the natural, your, your spiritual leaders require two. In obedience to God, we say two, right? And we don't even give that. We complain about that, and we find reason to miss that. So let's go back to it, right? We talked about the passion of Christ, everything Christ did. I appreciate you, Lord. I need to do better, so on and so forth, right? But then when it's time to do what's right, the little fox is spoiled divine. When it's time to obey God, we find reason not to. Simple as that is, but we don't find reason not to go to work because we want that paycheck. Unless we got some vacation or sick time. We don't find reason not to go to work. We find reason to miss church for everything, every little thing. You give you give one or two, three hours in the church, and we are like that's that's death row. But we'll go to a game, we'll watch a we watch a series of movies, especially lifetime. You, you know women don't talk about some of you brothers too. But <laughs> we watch those all day long. My point is, do you not see how subtle it is the enemy can easily trick us? When it comes to the things of the world compared to the things of God, when the things of the world, the devil never blocks you, never try to interfere up. You're always trying to encourage you to do it. But when it comes to the things of God, there's always a distraction and we fall for the trick. We fall for the rope of dope every time. So what if he came on a Sunday, right? We're in the movie. You see the beginning of the movie. Um, uh, where there's in the barbershop. Problem I had with that, the preacher in the chair. If you... Realize he must be a regular. They all know each other, right? They don't know the difference between him, the preacher, and him, the man. When you are a child of God, there should be a distinct difference. There should be a point of respect that they show you. You don't have to demand it. You don't have to demand it all. You just have to live it. And when you live it, they'll show it. And if they don't show it, you separate yourself. That's other barbershops. But my point is, he was too comfortable and didn't want to hear nothing about the rapture. Oh, man, gone with that. Didn't want to hear nothing. The preacher. So how do you expect any of those brothers in the church want to come to church when they see him doing that? And then the woman was obviously attracted to the pastor. He was checking her out. I mean, we men, we check out people. But you ain't got to make it that obvious, preacher. They got to make it that obvious, you know. Uh Yeah, everybody didn't get quiet when the boy talked talking about Jesus. But the preacher should have joined in. There were two preachers in there. They should have joined in, but they didn't. Because if you go to the Sunday service, when the preacher was preaching about the rapture, they were just comfortable. Religious preachers had no relationship, just religious with a cloth. There's a lot of religious preachers that got social media networks and churches going to hell because they won't do what God said do. You got to be obedient. I'm telling you, a title do not get you in automatic. It ain't no exemption clause. It ain't no, hey, you go to the front of the line. It's no giving in the marriage, no titles. We are brothers and sisters in Christ in heaven. A title here, whether it's self-given or by God, open door to more responsibilities. When you're walking in that anointing, you have more responsibilities. To my wife, she didn't make it to heaven. That's a good point. It don't really dictate why she didn't make it other than her focus was on a boy instead of God. Um, and she did lie, willfully lie, and, and did show her repent. But I don't know if that was it so much as maybe as a young teenager, young adult, her focus was more on the boy in the church or the boy she broke up with than God. Because when she talked to the boy on the phone, the conversation was about them. It wasn't enough about God. It wasn't like she talking about, she told him about not being managed, but they never talked about God. So I don't know. Maybe they were showing how young people are so focused on the cares of the world, they forget God. I don't know. That's a good point, though. And um, but in the barbershop, they didn't, they couldn't, they didn't show the preacher no respect because the preacher didn't earn it. They didn't separate themselves to a point where uh he joked about ah like y'all need to stop but he didn't say well praise the lord if the lord decided to give me a wife and that's her then god bless but if not i'm waiting on the lord you know what i'm saying something like that she said she thought she was saved now i'm not gonna lie to y'all i lost i lost my note for passing the cry and i don't seen sunday morning rapture about 
four times, but I didn't watch it all of it to get notes today. So I'm not gonna lie to you. But um, you had the man that had rich, then didn't, didn't want to go to church. Uh, but at the end, you see, he thought he can buy his way into heaven. You got people like that now because they pay tithe. God will honor your tithe pan and bless you. But God don't want your money. Your money part, listen, people that are against tithe, you are who you are. Hey Amen. That's your choice in life. And most people that are against tithing, if people just don't want to pay, let's just be honest about it. We're walking around almost like Judas. We, we all will just caring about the money. And then they say the preachers care about the money. Maybe so. But not all preachers. So people that don't want to pay tithing, but you want to sit in the church with lights on, you want to sit in the church with air and heat, you want to sit in church in comfortable chairs, but you don't want to contribute nothing to the ministry. Those are people that don't want to do nothing. And they don't understand the fullness of the scripture to walk in that disobedience to it. You know, God is the one blessed us with a job to be able to pay tithe. God don't want your money. It's obedience to him. Like, I'm going to give you another example. If I'm sitting here and God said, hey, um, I need you to plant a seed in Lisa Dawson. Like, give her $100. She's probably saying right now, yeah, Lord, yeah. <laughs> but if I'm obedient to that, God is going to give it back to me some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Right. Scripture says that it's not God want your money. It's your obedience to scripture. The little things, the little foxes. Right. It's obedience to scripture that opens up the thing that God wants to do in your life. And your obedience not always brings back money. Your obedience releases health. Your obedience uh, brings deliverance. Your obedience bring a move on your children. Your obedience opened doors to so many other things. It's not all. You can't always have a mentality. If I give to God, he's going to give back to me, press down, shake it together, and run over. It's not always financial. You want to be financial, you be specific in your prayers. But that overrunning is not always financial. Oh, I'm, I ain't been sick in 20 years. Look at the blessings, the overflow. We look at it the wrong way, and we think everything is about money. God don't want your money. He bless you with the money. It's your obedience to Scripture. That releases blessings behind every promise. There's a condition. And some people get so caught up and get mad when you talk about tithe. They want to get off the site. They don't want to talk no more. Those people that don't want to pay nothing, but you want to sit in church comfortable. The lights don't get on by themselves. Somebody got to pay the bill. There's insurance on the church. Most church got alarm systems. Most church got a sound system, musical stuff. All that's money in the church. Tithes and offering help with all that. Everybody want a comfortable church, but nobody want to contribute. Hey Amen. Nobody want to contribute, and it helps the leader. What it does for the leader, the Bible says, don't muzzle the ox that trade the corn. That means the pastor that bring forth the word, those pastors that are full-time, guess what those full-time pastors do? Real pastors. Let me clarify that. Real pastors. A real pastor is someone God have up three in the morning praying when you don't even know it. A real pastor is somebody going to go to the hospital when the members are there. They man, somebody going to go check on people. He, that's his job, to be available for the body and to be an intercessor 24 hours a day. Most real pastors don't get a lot of rest. Now, the one just taking your money and you don't see them on Sunday and don't even know who they is, that's a whole other story. But most real pastors don't get a lot of rest. So when you think pastors are taking your money, understand what most pastors go. They gonna sit there and broadcast you what God got them doing. That's too much like fasting and telling everybody you're fasting. They a real pastor, a real man of God that you know is walking according to the word. You just don't understand what they go through. That's not me now. I'm not in that real pastor role right now. But you don't understand, and I go through some stuff, but nothing compared to what they go through. They supposed to get paid because you supposed to provide them financially so they can be comfortable to pay bills to do the things they do to keep themselves afloat so that they can have a home, they can have an air condition, they can have all that so they can't distress and not worry about that because they worried about all their problems. They can't pray for you. Don't muzzle the ox that trade the coin. That's what the scripture says. And it's talking about feeding your leader, paying for your leaders. Yeah. 30,000 mink coat. Yeah, he realized his money couldn't get in the key. What the preacher told him, the same preacher in the barbershop, man, your money perish. Your, you, this money don't mean nothing no more. Yeah, the one with the wig, yeah. <laughs> it was too late. How many people that said they were going to stop? How many of y'all said it already? 
that you're going to stop this, stop that, give me a little more time, and one day you may be like that too late. Now, God don't, good question, Kaylin T, but uh, God don't save in the future. I'm going to tell you why. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God, you're so good. Um, God don't save based on that. Because why? The Bible said, Joshua said, choose ye this day. Every day is precious. That day you have is the day you got to make a choice. It's not tomorrow because the Bible said don't give no thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow may wait for itself. But if it be the Lord's will. So every day, like today, the day is the 19th of April, 2024. Amen. It's 834 Central Time. Amen. And if the rapture took place, you had a choice today to make. I like when people say God's still working on me. So I like to say if you die today, is God still working on you? No, judgment came. See, if you died and give up the gold, judgment just showed up. Ain't no he working on me tomorrow, because tomorrow not even promised. Judgment just showed up. So the thing that God is saying is choose today. Make a choice. Moses asked the question before a lot of people died. When Moses came off the mount, he said, who's on the Lord's side? Come over here. And the Bible says in two different occasions that one, God had Moses and the people come upon them with the sword. Kill children too. For y'all want to say how God allowed the children in Palestine to die. You better understand scripture. Understand generational curses. Moses them had to kill children too. When God in the Old Testament, thank God for grace under the law, when the parent did wrong, everybody suffered. That's why now in the grace, they suffer in the spiritual realm because when the parent do wrong, the demonic spirits are released to the children. Yeah, so when when Moses said, come on, Lord. One time the earth opened up and a lot of them died. But when he got into Joshua Lee, Joshua said, as for me and my house, you can't say that. Because see, two, this, some of y'all are false advertising. I would not put that sign at my door yet until I know I gave God my best. And I've been trying to give God my best for a long time. Some of us got them signs at our door. Them doormats say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And you know you're not serving God. you false advertiser. Quit lying to yourself. I will not put it up. The day I put it up, the day I know I've given God my best. I'm not saying it's wrong to put it up. I'm just saying I won't until I know I gave God my best. I got to know I gave God my best. All right? Uh, yeah, no more hope, no more tomorrow. Yeah, in those times, they was raised to no war because they had to go and conquer. And under the law, they had a lot of war. Now, under grace, God says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God fights our battle. He's the, he is El Gabor, the God of war. Amen. So, um, what else we talk about? Uh, the mink coat, the wig. That was funny. It ain't funny if you get left. And, and look at all them people were mourning and crying. That was a point where they didn't show it, but eventually they had to stop mourning and crying and go and realize they still left here. And now what people don't talk about, when the rapture take place, Antichrist, because the restraint has been removed, the Antichrist will have total dominating power. And they're going to get to a point, you've seen the comfortability of them in church, but it's going to get to a point that you need the mark to buy, sell, or trade. And they go get to a point that if you don't take the mark, you're going to be put to death. But yet them that was in that church know if they take that mark, they ain't going to make it in the kingdom. And so imagine the Holy Spirit is gone. You left on this earth because obviously you didn't have the Holy Spirit. You got left, right? So the Holy Spirit gone because if you had him, you'd win with him. You get that? If you'd had him, you'd win with him. So the Holy Spirit gone. They left on earth. And people think it's hard to live say now. Nah. Oh, my God. Can you imagine without the Holy Spirit here how hard it would be? So it didn't show that in the movie. All this stuff got to take place later. It's going to take place. So like uh, Tanny Lester, Zeus, Debo, or whatever you want to call him, when he was in the gym talking to the kids, there's going to be scenarios all over the world, just like those scenarios you saw, with a woman battling depression. Some of you battle depression. Some of you battling oppression. And you don't want to stop it. God has given you the authority and power to stop it, shut it down through the Holy Spirit. And you accept it with open arms and you walk around, woe is me, woe is me. 
and he tried to encourage her. Son of y'all are being encouraged by the saints. God is sending angels to you, and God is sending people to you to encourage you, and you still hollering, what was me? I just can't get up. I have no strength. I have no hope. There's everything negative. Ain't nothing like God can strengthen me. God will lift me up. God will. Ain't no speaking those things that be not as though they were, except in the negative sense. So she rejected God by listening to the enemy, in a sense. That's why she would love. The one guy, he was so worried about his bills, he couldn't go to church. God said, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, with prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God with all thanksgiving. We worry about stuff you can't control. Yeah, sit there and manage your bill, do all that, but you ain't no sense to worry about what you can't control. You can't control it. You got to trust God. Pay your tithes. You want blessings? You say you believe the word of God. You say you know God can move. You say God is a God that is righteous. You say there's conditions that bring the promises. Pay your tithes and watch God open doors for you. But keep rejecting your tithes and watch them curses be released in your life. You ain't got to believe me. Just keep living. You'll see it. I promise you that. If the word of God is true, you will see it. It ain't. I'm, I'm not speaking nothing on you. But if the word of God is true and God said a curse upon a curse, I know because I walked in them curses. Ooh, I told you how many times I went through, almost lost my house twice. Because of what? Because I wouldn't pay my tithes. I had to repent and get it right. They can still get saved during the revelation. I believe you can, but not like is a confession remember when we got saved we received the spirit of christ the baptism of the holy spirit was a different thing and the 144,000 are going to witness that israel may be saved so the gentiles there are still going to be some that going to believe in jesus christ they just not going to have the holy spirit and their confession of faith is going to be rejecting the mark rejecting everything the antichrist presents but their path of life is going to be so much harder i may be wrong but i do believe that there will be some people still get saved by uh not by grace because grace is gone but by obedience to scripture because the word is established it ain't gonna change because the, the church is gone the word is still established so i believe that if people still obey the word god honors the word even now when preachers misquote god's word or do this and that and people say, well, God still moved for that preaching. Then God didn't honor the preacher. He honored the word. The word is going to be honored. So I believe there's people that still obey the word because there's going to be some, some Elijahs and some Elishas in a sense of preaching the word in the midst of trials and tribulation. I'm not saying walking in the power of Elisha, except for them 144,000. But I believe that people still going to have an opportunity to either deny the enemy or deny Christ. And I could be wrong. I could be 100% wrong. It's just what I believe. So, yeah, I think it's hard to be saved without the Holy Spirit. But being saved is a confession, right? If thou shalt confess in thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, thou shalt be saved. Now, there's no baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's no power. There's no anointing. But salvation is based on a confession and a repentance. It didn't say in the Bible that God will not receive repentance. It said we all should light white pairs except he repent. Yeah. Yeah, so they had so many scenarios. The young people, uh, the, the boy that got the girl pregnant, that was the crazy mama with the wig, generational curse. Um, the one pastor, that wasn't the head pastor, but the one pastor that was standing in the pulpit and said, all them souls I misled, all them, there's going to be a lot of preachers like that. There's going to be a lot of preachers like that, that sugarcoated the word, watered down the word, told the people what they want to hear to keep people in the church so the tithes and offering would keep coming. I would, I would tell you guys this here, with, with sincerity in my heart, if you following somebody that don't have an anointing follow somebody that's not obedient to christ and you don't see the jesus in them why would you still follow them why would you still follow? why would you follow somebody that's on their way to hell you want a trip too you want a ticket a two for one special 
Find God is not a God that will not answer you if you really want a church or a pastor that will lead you to righteousness and holiness. God will give you what you want. God is not going to allow you to stay out there. You choose to stay out there because God don't force you to do nothing. He guides and directs you with all truth. Why would you follow a pastor? Because you've been there all your life. Your family went there. Did not God take Abram to come out from your father and your kindred so I can show you a better way? Yeah. He was going with her, but she broke up with him. Remember, that's why she was trying to get to know the other boy. See, they whole conversation wasn't about God. It was about she dumped Bobby because Bobby got the girl pregnant and Bobby smoked weed and drank and she was with this guy. She wanted to get him, but her focus was on him. It never said in the movie that she had salvation or she talked about God. She just talked about those issues. So I don't know why she got left behind other than maybe that, but it never. she never talked about God. The only one that made it in heaven on that movie, those that talked about Jesus, and though they accept him right to that moment. You know that? Them all the ones. Them the only ones in the movie you saw that got raptured out. Those that uh, was that was talking about it. Yeah, pretty much. And that's why I never understood how saints can be around other saints and never talk about God. That blows my mind. So, um, but that pastor was talking about how he left he, so many souls. There's going to be a lot of preachers get beat up that day because there's going to be some saints real life. I've been following you and you stuck here and I'm stuck here with you. There's going to be some a lot of preachers get beat up that day. Uh, what else in the movie? Y'all y'all coming along with I like it. You know, just a few of y'all, but y'all come along. <laughs> Answer no questions. I uh, Can you listen? Let's be honest. In this natural thinking, right, it's hard for my mind to comprehend heaven. Don't misunderstand me, please. I know there's a heaven, and I know I'm going there. But your mind can only think with it loud. In other words, you can't even found the things of God. You can't even, you hear the stories, you think about heaven in different ways. But if we honest, when people think about death, they don't want to die. The flesh don't want to die. We, we all say, oh, I can't wait to go to heaven. But... We ain't really doing nothing trying to get there. A lot of us ain't doing nothing to try to get there. We're just going through the motion. If you really believe heaven is real and you know it's there, you'll be working every day to get there. You'll make choices each day and you'll try your best to make sure you get there. But because we don't comprehend it, because the flesh can't comprehend it, you believe by your spirit, you believe by faith, but you can't even fathom what heaven looks like. Yeah, river streets paved with gold, and you, you don't know. You just going by what you heard because your mind can't comprehend unless the spirit shows you. The Bible said that the things of God are a mystery unless the Holy Spirit reveals them to us. But when you focus on God, you set your affection on things above, you get in that word, you allow the Holy Spirit to stir up in you. You begin to look for those things. My flesh don't want to die. Let's just be honest. My spirit, whenever God says time. And see, a lot of us ain't faced with death. A lot of us ain't laying on the bed with a doctor saying you're going to die in three months. It's a whole different perspective. You'll find out how ready you really are. I hope none of us get there. But you'll find out how ready you really are if somebody tell you you got three months to live. Yeah. It's not about how high you can jump up, but how, how you live and come back down preaching empty word. That's so true. And there's a lot of empty word. There's a lot of empty words in this in the world today. There's a lot of preachers. The man that I told him, I said, I'm gonna buy a case of chicken and I want to plant it to your ministry. He said, Well, I'm ministry. I say, when you take the time to feed these kids in this community, that's a ministry. He said, Yeah, about 25 kids. They're gonna cook on Sunday. I said, I probably won't give you nothing this week. I said, but when I get the money. I said, I want to sow it to your ministry. I want to buy that. So you guys want to store the chickens here. I said, what all you cook? He said, barbecue. He said, ribs and chicken. He said, I feed about 25 children every week. And I'm sure not that cousin up a storm, but they don't know no different. That's all they know. You got to love them, win them, to win them over to God. And I want to be a part of that ministry. I don't want to take over. I don't want to do nothing but show my face sometimes, love on them. But I want to plant into the ministry by buying chicken and buying ribs so he can feed those kids. And maybe get my wife to cook a couple of dishes here and there. Um, uh, 
Girl, stop by that dog, man. <laughs> Y'all both need to stop. <laughs> uh, so, there's an old, there's an old uh, cartoon movie, an uh, animation movie, Dog Dog Go to Heaven. But anyway, um, it's just something to think about, man. So much in life that we can be doing for God, and and we spend so much time idle. We spend think think about it now. We spend more time idle than we do active. You believe that? Yeah, true. The most active most of y'all are when y'all come on YouTube, Facebook to hear ministry. Not everybody, but most people only active when they come on here. Most time we caught up in our daily activities of work. We don't do nothing other. Than we at work all day long. We don't minister. We don't pray. We don't sing. We don't talk to God. We just go through the routine of life, work, and oh Lord, thank you. Oh God, it's been a good day. Oh no, no, God wants some time. God wants some time. Yeah. Any more questions? We're gonna try to sum it up. It's good. Good observations. Good observations. Tomorrow morning, the Lord said it's saying we need to go to New Orleans to support our first lady in the funeral for her brother. We coming straight back from there, back to Moss Point to support my friend, his mother's funeral. And so tomorrow's a busy day for me. Um, but I, um, in the morning, uh, please come on, support Pastor Hudson for the Zoom. Uh, please, uh, I'm asking y'all, I'm begging y'all, just Saturday. Nine o'clock central, ten o'clock eastern, to come on and support Pastor Hudson Zoom in the morning. Please do that for me. You welcome, Sister Octavia. I hope you enjoyed it. Bruce Restore post that Zoom. Thank you so much. Um, and y'all, please come on. It's a reasonable accent, so please come on. Please just show your love. Show your love for that ministry. Amen. He comes on on Zoom, that same Zoom. I think the channel is different than you, but I know Sundays, I mean, Saturday is 9 o'clock Central, 10 Eastern, and then Sunday is 5 Central and 6 Eastern. He come on Saturdays and Sundays, and we on this ministry try to support him on that ministry. So please come on and support him. You can listen while you walk through the house. Just, just listen to the ministry. Show love. Just show yourself on there. Show love, please. There's a reason I'm asking y'all. Just show love. Um, about it. So, any any other perspective on the movie before we close out? I mean, anything that y'all seen, y'all y'all observed? And you can tune in to Kevin Bolden that I hop my ch the church I go to. <clears throat> that ministry um, on Sunday, Evangelist Francis will be teaching or bringing forth the word on Sunday, 1030 Central Time, 1130 Eastern Time. We go live on Facebook under Kevin Bolden dash AHA and uh, come support Evangelist Francis. She'll be teaching on that then. But uh, we try to mix up ministry. We have guests on Fridays and I want to do more things to be able to teach the word of God, but to bring excitement to you guys uh, that you want to, you look forward to something that entice you, encourage you, but don't contradict the word to get more of the word. Amen. That makes sense. So if y'all got ideals, I'm open to suggestions that we can do more things to get people involved so we can bring the word out, but have a good time doing it. There are going to be people, Sister Octavia, uh, there are going to be people sleeping, working, uh, driving, sinning, a lot of things when that when the rapture takes place. Because he's coming as a thief in the night. And ain't nobody going to know, even though I got a video right now that I, I can't can't believe it. I'm going to look at it. I ain't going to say nothing. It's a, a preacher I respect a lot. And he predicted 2025 the rapture going to take place. I got to watch that video first. Because I was shocked even that he even tried to predict it. Yeah, Riley realized all his life he thought his money can buy anything. He realized it can buy salvation.
Kaylin, if we don't stay focused and we don't keep our determination, a lot of us are gonna get left behind and get stuck. It's a fight every day, man. It's a fight every day. I mean, it's a fight. And we got to stay focused on that fight. I think if everybody will watch that movie, everybody ain't going to get saved. But a lot of people will because the Bible says that uh, a lot of people are going to reject the word. That no matter what you do, they're going to reject the word. All you can do is pray for them and keep encouraging them. And more importantly, keep loving them. But they're going to reject the word. But we're going to find a stopping point. It's been an hour and 30 minutes. We've been on here. Yeah, yeah, everything. I ain't gonna say everything is a distraction, but it could be because the enemy used stuff to distract us, to keep us out of focus, to keep us caught up on. He just he's good at what he do. We just gotta be better at what we do. He's been doing it way longer than we have, but we got the Holy Spirit been him that created him. Amen. So we listen to the Holy Spirit. Ain't nothing the devil can throw at us. I'm asking God to show me something now about something. Amen. Because I just feel something ain't right in my spirit. And I'm asking God to show me something about somebody. But uh you know, but I appreciate you guys. Uh, again, come on in the morning, please, at nine o'clock central, 10, 10 o'clock eastern, to support Pastor Hudson for his uh, uh, Zoom meeting he has. And uh, I believe you'll be blessed through it. I believe you'll be blessed. Amen. And uh, God bless you all. I don't, I'm going to listen to it, but I'll be on the road to New Orleans when I'm listening to it. Uh, God bless you, Sister Dago. Hey, see, that's what I'm talking about right there. She said she sent it to several family members. You can't control whether they look at it, listen to it or not, but you don't know till you try. I recommend that all of y'all send it to at least one person, and you never know it make a difference in their life. You never know. We don't learn things from God to sit on it. We learn things from God to use it to help bless somebody else. All right. Been on here a long time. God bless you all. I'm tired. We did nine yards today, and I'm tired. So God bless. I got to get up early in the morning, go to New Orleans, and uh, I probably won't eat till we get through with all the funerals because I do not eat and go into a funeral. Ain't nothing like trying to sit in a funeral with a full stomach. So the second we go from, unless we get something from after the first, first from the 11, we'll leave out there after 12, head it back this way, unless we stop real quick to get something. Um, the other funeral started at three. Thank you, baby. All right. God bless you. Love you all. In Jesus' name, I'll be on Zoom in the morning. Hope to see you there. God bless you in Jesus' name.